Hi there, good morning, welcome back to IndyCar on the 3rd of February. The news today on energy bills is pretty grim and um, you could be forgiven for thinking that there is absolutely no hope at all that uh, any of us are going to escape the, the clutches of the energy companies and the exorbitant amounts of money that they're going to charge us for our energy. The situation is complicated in a number of ways. The British government put in place an energy price cap which, as you know, is keeping prices low at the moment. Well, relatively low at the moment. That price cap uh, ends in April this year, and a new price cap will need to be introduced. But it's widely expected that the new price cap uh, will mean an increase in our domestic fuel bills of approximately 50%, more than we're paying at the moment. And that could be as much as well, £500 a year uh, to a fairly um, low energy consumption household. Now that obviously is going to be beyond the means of many of us uh, to afford our energy bills. So what is the British government proposing to do about this? Because the Scottish government can't do anything about energy bills because it has no power over energy policy. Well, the Tories are proposing a very complicated and, frankly, a nonsensical arrangement. First of all, the energy price cap that they've got in place at the moment has already bankrupted at least half a dozen small British energy retailers. And the remaining ones are about to be bankrupted by the new energy policy because, quite frankly, the, the way the government is going about this is it is putting the... Uh, the onus, in other words, it's putting all the responsibility for reducing bills to you and I on the actual energy companies who are retailing that, in other words, selling it to you and me. Now, these are not necessarily the firms who are making the energy. In fact, they're not making the energy. They have to buy gas, for example, in order to generate electricity from oil companies. It's the oil companies who are profiteering off the backs of everyone at the moment. Uh, companies like Shell and BP, who operate in the North Sea just now, under licence to the United Kingdom, have seen their profits rise by about 400% in a single year. I believe that the takings for BP and Shell this year were somewhere in the region of £19 billion uh, from the sale of gas and oil. Now, it's fairly obvious, as I've said many times in the past, that the British government gave away our oil to these uh, these big oil and gas companies uh, by simply having very little taxation. And because they have very little taxation, basically the oil companies are simply paying a license fee and a very small amount of tax on the petroleum that they refine from what they actually get out of the North Sea. However, that doesn't seem to apply to gas. And uh, because it doesn't apply to gas, the, uh, the oil companies who are extracting both oil and gas and are selling this to the open market, they actually control how much gas is in the global system at the moment. And by not uh, increasing production, they force the prices up. Now, many people claim that it is the Russians and their sale of gas to the European Union which is causing these price rises, but that's not strictly true. Because other energy companies such as BP and Shell and Exxon and various others, Mobil, there are countless other uh, oil companies who are extracting both oil and gas from the North Sea, it is they who are not increasing gas production. By increasing the supply to match the demand, the price would fall, but that's not what they're doing. So instead of actually taxing the companies who are ripping everybody off across the planet at the moment, the British government is proposing to put another price cap on the energy firms who are retailing the energy, which is going to make them pay for the increased prices. But the plan that the United Kingdom government has come up with is so ridiculously cack-handed and at the wrong end of the, the entire chain of supply that it makes no sense that they're actually planning to give government loans huge amounts of money, billions of pounds in government loans from the UK Treasury to the retail companies, that's people like uh, Ovo Energy, Octopus Energy, and so on, Scottish Power, so that they can keep our bills down. But, and there's actually two buts here, the amount of money that they are planning to lend to these companies will only reduce the bills by about 40%. 
So if you imagine that your bill has gone up by £500, then the reduction in the bill because of these government loans to the energy retailers is going to be a lot less than that. It's going to be less than half of £500, which means you're still going to be paying the better part of £350 more in your energy bills. And not only that, it gets worse, okay? Imagine it couldn't possibly get worse, but it does. Because the loans that the government is giving are to the retailers, the retailers are then being asked to gradually increase our energy bills over the following years after this so-called energy price spike. So our bills are set to increase incrementally every year thereafter so that the energy retailers can pay back their loans to the British government. All of which means that in the end of all of this, uh, and that's, you know, could take years, could take decades, you and I are still paying for this massive price hike. It's not the oil companies who are being taxed, who really should be, it's you and me. So no matter which way you slice this, although they're going to give us 40% relief on the immediate price hike, the rest of that money, which we would have paid, is still going to be paid back by us through increasing energy bills over the next 10 years. Right? With me so far, it's very complicated and unnecessarily complicated. In actual fact, what the British government should really do if it wants to actually protect us from these price caps is tax the oil companies a lot. And I'm talking about a lot more than they are at the moment. Taxing them enough that these oil prices and gas prices, which have been rising to four times their normal level, go back down again for you and I. That will force the energy companies like Shell and uh, BP to increase production or face losses. Right at the moment, the British government is hammering you and I. It's going to hammer the energy retailers as well for a while. But the daft thing about this is the British government actually believes that these rising costs of gas on the, re on the uh, wholesale market are only going to live, you know, be short-lived for a year or so. But this is not the case. There is no sign of these energy price rises going back down again, simply because the oil and gas companies who supply this stuff are not planning to increase the supply of it. They don't want the price to, to drop. The share prices of both BP and Shell have skyrocketed overnight. They are making billions and billions of pounds and not paying any real taxes on it to the UK government. If they were, the UK government could then use that money to offset the cost of the rising price of the fuel, in which case they could then actually give grants to the, uh, the retail energy suppliers if they wanted to, which would completely remove these rises. Or they could give money to households directly, which would offset all of these increases. But they're not going to do that either. Remember that the British Tory party is a free market, uh, neoliberal organization and as far as they're concerned they don't want to tax the oil companies they want profits to be as high as possible because many of the Tory party and their donors have got shares in these oil companies and they will be raking in millions as a result as well so the only real chance we have of escaping from this massive hike in energy bills is actually to leave the UK Union completely and then have the ability to tax the oil companies operating in our section of the North Sea so that we don't have to pay these enormous bills. Right at the moment, international and transnational oil companies are actually running governments. They're telling governments what to do. And because they have bought off these politicians, who are now probably shareholders in these very companies that are making these profits, we can't hope that the Tory party or its donors or its MPs are going to do absolutely anything at all about the rising uh, profits being ripped out of you and I, basically, by these massive oil companies. So there is another problem. And the other problem is that inflation is rising. Now, the British government and the Bank of England, in their usual way, are assuming that the only way to control inflation is by raising the cost of borrowing. So they are planning, the Bank of England, are planning to raise the base rate, lending rate, from 0.1% by another 0.25%, another quarter of 1%. So they're basically going to double the, the, um, 
the repayments basically on any money borrowed. Now, that would be fine if the cause of the inflation in the UK was down to us, was down to us borrowing too much money, but that's not the case. The reason that we have this price inflation is because there is a rise in prices across the whole planet. Not only energy prices, but food prices, transport costs, and of course the effects of Brexit making transport even more expensive are going to push our food bills up dramatically because we will not be able to get the kind of produce from abroad that we used to enjoy. And so everything that we now get in our supermarkets is largely going to have to be sourced from our own growers, which sounds like a great idea, except that our own growers don't have the capacity to actually feed us completely. We, we need to import food, or rather the UK does. So the problems that we face at the moment are a massive spike in inflation. It's now running well over 5% across the UK. It's 5.5% across the European Union and rising everywhere else. However, Britain's economy is not expanding properly. It's expanded at, I think, 1.3% over the last year. Compare that with Turkey, which is often criticised for having higher inflation than we have. Their inflation rate is running at almost 20%. And yet the Turkish economy, strangely, is expanding at 6.8%. It's one of the highest growth rates in the European Union. Now, why is that? Why isn't it being reported? So we're in a weird situation where basically global forces outside the control of the United Kingdom, except incidentally for the oil firms who they could be taxing, are actually determining what happens to us. We are at the mercy of global markets at the moment. And the one thing that we could actually do to help ourselves, which is basically to become independent and start taxing the oil companies who are extracting this wealth from our North Sea, uh, we cannot do because we're attached to the United Kingdom. We have to become independent in order to deal with that. Now, the question of independence is one which uh, myself and a number of other um, contributors to this program have been researching in great detail to try and find out why it is so difficult for Scotland to have a referendum. Now, there are a number of very complicated, intertwined legal reasons why a Section 30 order is supposedly necessary for us to have a legitimate referendum on independence. However, the SNP's stated position is that if a Section 30 order is not forthcoming, then they will continue to organise a legal referendum by passing a bill in Holyrood, which would allow us to hold the ballot in Scotland, without the official sanction of the United Kingdom. Now, the result of that referendum is something I'll come back to in a moment, but the legality of this, the fact that the United Kingdom thinks it can stop this referendum, is not actually true, because for a number of, well, democratic reasons, Scotland has a number of guarantees that it has the democratic right to ask people uh, to make this choice between remaining in the UK and leaving it. Because of that, it's not widely believed that the United Kingdom can actually physically stop us from voting on independence. The only thing that they could do would be to not recognise the result of the vote. However, having said that, if we proceed towards our independence referendum as planned in 2023, and the bill which is currently, which I've seen the published bill incidentally, which the uh, Scottish Government is planning to present to Holyrood, and at the moment that bill does not have a date on it for the referendum. I can tell you that if, this, if the British government attempts to thwart the Scottish independence referendum by holding an emergency general election at an awkward moment, that Holyrood is perfectly within its rights as a parliament to vote to change the date. So we can alter the date. So the British government would have to hold another general election later on to try and stop it again. So we have the right to do that. It's not clear at the moment because of, of the fact that A, the British government does not have a written constitution, and B, the Scottish Parliament and the Scottish nation as a whole never actually came up with legislation which gave itself the written right uh, to make laws which say that they can actually hold referendums and ask you know, ask the public if they want to stay in the Union. Uh, and because of the lack of all this documentation, most of the, uh, the constitutional question is surrounded in this fog of uncertainty. Legally speaking, we can legislate to have our own referendum. In terms of UK law, 
that creates a problem because if the Queen, for example, refused to give royal assent or delayed royal assent to try and hold things up, we could still press on without royal assent just because it's normally given uh, at the stage just before a bill becomes an act in Parliament at Holyrood doesn't mean that it can't be turned into an act at Holyrood because it's largely seen as a rubber stamp. It's seen as a, uh, what should we say, a symbolic act by the monarch who's basically just signing off on a law which has been democratically arrived at by a, uh, a legitimately elected government. And that wouldn't change. So we hold the referendum. Let's say we have a yes vote and, uh, and everybody rejoices. Now that yes vote no matter what the uh, majority for it is, stands. It stands as a legitimate expression of our self-determination. Because Scotland isn't actually recognised in the United Nations as a colony, in other words, we're not being held against our will, we're not being repressed by force, we're not being occupied effectively by a foreign pair with its soldiers, there are no human rights abuses taking place, although some would argue uh, the case about Julian Assange and also Craig Murray being human rights cases. But that aside, there is not genocide going on. There is not uh, the abuse of power that we see in other colonised countries. So the United Nations, despite the fact that Scotland is entitled to express its self-determination, the United Nations does not see us as a colony and might still for the time being at least, uh, respect the borders of the United Kingdom, which of course isn't a country, but is a union of two countries. So there remains this massive fog of uncertainty. But the one certainty in all of this is that we will hold the referendum and there will be a result. And whatever the result is, it will stand. The question then is, how does the rest of the world react to that? We know that the British government in England will say that it's not legitimate and they will not respect it. But they could be the only government which does that. But Scotland is then placed in a position where uh, there will be challenges from all sides, especially from the British government, on whether or not the people have expressed their opinion legally, which is a little bollocks, because it would be perfectly legal. It would also be perfectly democratic, and the British government couldn't challenge that. They couldn't say that it wasn't democratic, especially if it was done under law here, and especially if it was done in exactly the same way, uh, apart from the royal assent and apart from the Section 30 order, as it was in 2014. The only thing that would be missing from that would be the so-called permission from the United Kingdom. So at the end of all of this, if we want to become independent, we have to have this vote, and the result of it we have to stand by, and that means that our government, whichever one it is, in Holyrood at the time when we express this view and say we get a yes vote, uh, that that vote must stand for all time, and it must stand. And you can use the, uh, the last referendum we saw, which was the Brexit referendum, which was only advisory, incidentally. The fact that it was actioned by the United Kingdom creates a legal precedent, and the precedent is that the United Kingdom will act and will respect the will of the people in a an advisory referendum. And if it applies to Brexit, then legally speaking, in international law, they must apply it to a yes vote to independence as well. Otherwise, they will be seen for what they are, a non-democratic authoritarian regime. The question then is, does that matter to the Tories? Well, it's going to matter to us. And as far as I can see, we must vote on this. We must establish this yes vote. Whether or not it's recognised by England is irrelevant. As long as we express the will, then the democracy has been uh, actioned and we have made the choice. It's then a question of the courage of our own politicians to stand by that and not to budge, to say we've expressed our will, we're going to leave, what are you going to do about it? And at that point, we don't know what will happen. And this is where the SNP government is. This, the legality or otherwise, but the democratic will of the people in this particular respect has never been tested. And it's never been tested in international courts. But it needs to be tested because this is the only way that we can do it. And that's why we can't just simply announce uh, unilaterally that we're independent at the moment. If we get to that point where we voted yes, 
and that is the established will of the people and it stands. It's at that point, if all other doors are closed to us, and that the British government will not move, uh, and that nobody steps in to give us a hand, or maybe we get some support from other countries, but not all of them, that's the point at which we would need to decide whether we declare our independence unilaterally or not. But that would be a very, very last resort, uh, and only if all other legal options had been exploit, uh, exhausted. So it's a long way to go, but the first step is to have the referendum. The referendum bill does exist, and I've seen it, I've seen the published version of it. It, at the moment, uh, does not contain the details of who can vote, and it does not contain uh, the date on which the ballot will take place. It does contain the question, and the question remains, should Scotland be an independent country? And that has always been the question, and I think that will always remain the question until we answer it in 2023. Anyway, that's it for today, but just remember that until we are independent, we can't control the cost of our energy. We can't tax the companies which are basically digging the oil and gas out of the North Sea and charging us eye-watering amounts of money because they are so greedy that they will not meet the demand for gas by creating enough supply. That's their choice, and it's the British government's choice at the moment just to allow them to do that. We could have that choice if we weren't in the UK. I'll see you soon. Bye-bye.